O tēnā koutou katoa, no mai hari mai, ko Sophie Sparrow toko inoa. A uh, kei ko nā moana fa koka aho e mahiana, he kai tohu tohu aho. Hello everybody, thank you all for being here today. Uh, my name is Sophie Sparrow, I am a communications advisor for the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge and I will be your facilitator for the webinar today. So here in Aotearoa, uh, we are surrounded by a marine territory which is 15 times larger than our land. Currently, the law and policy governing our marine environment is split across multiple pieces of legislation that sit within different regulatory institutions. Uh, recent published research from our policy and legislation for EBM project has highlighted some critical and timely opportunities in policy areas for ecosystem-based management principles to be adopted as a holistic and inclusive way to manage our marine environment. So today you'll be hearing from the team behind this research, uh, but before we begin, just some quick housekeeping. Uh, so this webinar is being recorded and we will have the recording up on our YouTube channel within the next day or so if you'd like to share that with others uh, and we will share the link to this via email when it's ready. Uh, our presenters are going to speak for uh, roughly the first half hour uh, and then we're going to have a good 20 minutes or so for question and answers. Uh, so you can submit your questions using the Q&A function which will be down the bottom of your screen. Uh, and I will read the questions out to our presenters so that everyone in the recording can hear them. Uh, and please feel free to send your questions through the Q&A at any time during the presentation uh, and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, otherwise, that's all from me. Over to you, Liz. Kia ora, Sophie. Um, ngā mihi nui ke koutou. Ko Liz McPherson tōko ingoa. Um, ko Ngāti Pākia te iwi. Ko Ingarangi te whakapaparanga mai no Wararapa o tēnā tātou katoa. Um, kia ora everyone, I'm Liz McPherson and um, I'm an Associate Professor of Law at the University of Canterbury um, and co-leader of the Law and Policy for EBM project in the Sustainable Seas Challenge. I'm here with my co-leader Eric Jorgensen um, from the Law and Policy Project and also Karen Fisher who's an Associate Professor at the Faculty of Science at the University of Auckland who um, leads the Enhancing EBM Practices theme. And we have been doing research on law and policy to support ecosystem-based marine management or EBM as part of the Sustainable Seas Challenge for the past um, five years. And at the start of this research, we, as we came together as a team, we decided that law and policy alone were not going to set us on the path that we need to be on to transition to healthy and flourishing marine ecosystems and related peoples. Um, but actually that building relationships between policymakers and decision makers across scales was what was really key to this transition. And as we come to the end of our substantive research project and we think about um, the impact that we want our research to have in Aotearoa, we've circled back to that key, um, that key position. And it's super important for us to manage the intersections between the different policies and legal frameworks that we have that manage human relationships with the ocean and with coastal areas. Um, so today we want to highlight some of those findings um, and what they might mean for the future of marine law and policy in Aotearoa. Okay, so we know that there are multiple laws and policies that affect marine areas um, and marine resources in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, this is a familiar sustainable seas graphic, um, which shows the main um, legal and policy frameworks. And we also know that these are not always well aligned and they don't always speak to each other very well. Um, this is referred to as fragmentation and it's the problem that an ecosystem-based marine management approach is intended to respond to. We also know that there is a complex set of legal and policy arrangements that impact on Māori relationships, rights and interests in marine and coastal areas. Um, 
And there has been some really fantastic research done um, coming out of this, the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge about Māori rights, interests, relationships and economies. Um, and this is just an example here, which shows the complexity um, of this from, from a Tao Māori perspective. I'm going to hand over to Eric to talk about this slide. Yeah, so that fragmentation and complexity is, is you know, how we're managing these systems as people, but the, the, the systems themselves, the ecology and the socio-ecological systems are incredibly complex as well. I guess most people are probably a little bit familiar with the system mapping approach, but this is this is a small system map that we put together um, in collaboration with Fisheries New Zealand, um, Māori, um, fishery sector stakeholders for multi species finfish management in Tasman Golden Bay. Um, so we 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 we're, we're picturing here a very complex system, um, and the different colours highlight the different pieces of legislation and and organisations that have responsibility for those, um, and and we're seeing that just in that one bay across five finfish species, there are four management organisations involved in that. And everything they do affects everyone else with feedback loops, time lapses and things like that. So we, we the, these maps, actually the process of developing these maps is, is very beneficial. Um, we've found they've been done in Hawke Bay, they've been done for the scallop fishery as well. Uh, in terms of getting the different stakeholders, if you will, um, engaged and understanding the impacts that they have on, on socio-ecological systems and one another. When we pull a lever here, it actually triggers something over there and, and getting an understanding of those um, relationships, building those um, is, is really beneficial to, in terms of overcoming the fragmentation that does exist um, between the legislation and our organization. So after that, well, actually before that, we, we did some work. Um, if you want to flick over, Liz, please. Um, our, our first piece of work was actually looking outside of Aotearoa um, at different attempts to uh, uptake, embed EBM into law and practice. And, and surprise, surprise, as I was not unique. Um, everywhere we looked, there, there, was, there, there remains high levels of, of complexity and fragmentation uh, of marine law across different sectors and different scales. Um, so we're not going to overcome that. As Liz said at the outset, um, it, it's inevitable that we will because the oceans are incredibly complex. Um, not only do you have the mountains, but the sea thing happening, you've got multiple people engaging with the oceans that, that share some values, but have different values as well. Um, so we, we concluded that we should avoid the temptation to try and create one piece of policy to rule them all. Um, and rather, being a little bit playful, we should embrace this fragmentation and, and complexity because um, it's not going to go away. Uh, and it, as we will continually say, and, and we, we, we feel the pathway forward to doing that is to build the relationships between institutions, between people, between sectors, um, and have that over time. So then, Liz, if you want to flick over, please, we started thinking about how that looks, um, and and quite simply, you know, we we we, we kind of sit, and maybe not so much now, but we we are moving in Aotearoa New Zealand towards more collaborative and integrated approaches, but we're we're a long way from being there, so we don't sit in the bottom left hand corner, um, quite, but we're certainly a long way away from being at the top right where we are collaboratively and. and managing our oceans in an integrated manner. Um, it, it, 
And the other thing that, that we concluded when, we, when we we're thinking about this is that e EVM is not an endpoint. I think, I think that's really important. Um, it, it, it's, it, if you add in the background that I come from, we, you know, we, continuous process improvement is, is something we we'll always be striving for. And, and we just know that wild cards like climate change and, and the world's not going to stop changing um, physically, ecologically. And so we need to be, I don't want to say nimble, but I just did. We need to be nimble and adaptive in, in, in responding to that. Um, so there's no end point. And, and that, again, is a, is a reason why we think, you know, understanding the relationships that we need to take ourselves forward is really critical and, and not embedding ourselves with a solely policy and legislative based approach. Um, then we had a look at what was happening in, in New Zealand specifically. Um, and this piece of work was led by Steve Ehrlich and Hamish Rennie, um, looking at, at existing legal and policy mechanisms that, that could support EBM and do support EBM at a, at a regional and local scale. Um, and what we found, if you want to look over, thanks, Liz, um, is that we are acknowledging the relationships between, say, the Resource Management Act, Fisheries Act, um, Takatai Moana, um, but they actually operate themselves at different scales which creates some more complexity. Um, they, that's both on a, on a spatial and temporal basis. Um, so the maps depict um, that. And, and so it's difficult to effectively align those different tools because they're operating at different spatial and temporal, temporal scales. Um, but we are actually doing some stuff. Um, technical term from Eric, um, but but we're not consistently implementing um, across across Aotearoa. Um, so at a regional level, there is an opportunity to 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 make some probably quite rapid progress um, in terms of integrating and, and developing tools. Uh, we see we see more and more, for instance, uh, Rahui being being put in place to, to manage um, fish stock, fish stocks where there's issues. Um, there's been a number put in place for for scallops, for instance. Um, but how we're using those tools, as I said, is is really inconsistent. So there's opportunities here with our existing framework to move the needle, if you will, towards DBM. How we get there um, in a consistent way um, is, is critical. It's ad hoc. Is, is the short story really into how we're how we're using these tools at the moment? Um, I'll hand over to Karen now. I think. Thanks, Eric. And picking up on that point of moving the needle, the next piece of research. Um, was really interested in thinking about uh, tracing the possibilities for supporting EBM through trends and governance approaches in Aotearoa. So looking at what we're already doing um, and within that sort of fragmented institutional um, arrangement that has already been spoken about. So in this piece of research, we found that environmental governance is undergoing a shift, one that increasingly emphasizes collaboration between government and communities and also emphasizes the importance of place-based decision-making. There's also a shift in governance arrangements in terms of how the environment is understood um, in relation to people, which is informed by and better aligns with um, Māori worldviews, knowledges and values. So we found there's potential in, in seeing EBM as, as a, enabling a strategic approach to managing the marine environment because of the synergies with indigenous worldviews and knowledges, and particularly given the emphasis on interconnectedness, inclusivity, diversity, and relationality. Next slide, please, Liz. So based on our analysis of existing governance arrangements in Aotearoa, we propose four PO or enabling conditions 
to enhance governance for EBM. And um, we also suggested that these POs could, and in, in enhancing governance for EBM, they can also accommodate both Indigenous and non-Indigenous worldviews, knowledges and values. So this figure um, illustrates the PO and provides a summary of each. So the first PO, enacting interactive administrative arrangements, emphasises and recognises the potential of collaboration and engaging multiple actors across multiple levels. The second PO, diversifying knowledge production, recognises the importance of accommodating different ways of knowing, being and doing, and prompts action towards thinking and doing things differently. The third PO, prioritising equity, justice and social difference, emphasises undoing the inequities and injustices perpetuated against Māori people and the need for inclusivity in terms of decision making to better provide for relationships between people, especially Māori, and the environment. The fourth PO, uh, recognising interconnections and interconnectedness, emphasises humans as part of ecosystems and the myriad relationships between humans and environments. So this research demonstrated what is possible based on what is already being done. The potential to further enhance governance for EBM is evident in innovations and possibilities afforded by community-based initiatives, laws and policies, including, for example, Te Awa Tupua, Te Uruwera, Te Mana o Te Taio, and Te Mana o Te Wai. Next slide, please, Liz. So there is more to come from the other projects, in, uh, other projects within Sustainable Seas and within the Enhancing EBM Practices theme that highlight these opportunities and possibilities and also deepen our collective understanding of governance for EBM and what is needed. In particular, the research coming out also seeks to emphasise the importance of respecting partnership with Iwi Māori and following fair process that respects the Wakatauru um, model. So for example, Tangaroa Ararau is exploring the relationship between Te Tiriti o Waitangi and EBM, and they've been focusing their efforts on exploring different governance models and looking in particular at customary provisions, Māori commercial interests and takutai moana. And this research builds in many ways on research coming out of phase one where, um, and, and seeking to provide insights but on different kinds of treaty-based governance or the implications of the treaty for um, governance arrangements in relation to EBM and what might a treaty-based governance approach look like. And additionally, other research which will be um, coming out that explores the relationship between ecosystem-based management and kaitiakitanga through the spheres of influence model um, with case studies in each of these different spheres. So the kawanatanga, rangatiratanga and relational spheres. Um, and I'll hand back to you, Liz. Kia ora. Um, so the pressing question <clears throat> underpinning all of our research is how can we transition towards a system that better supports thriving marine ecosystems and related peoples and does so in a, a way that is compliant with Te Tiriti or Waitangi. Um, and at the same time, that does so in a way that's sensitive to the challenges of um, scale dynamics across time and place. We've recently published some research um, on designing marine law and policy for the health and resilience of marine ecosystems um, that came out recently in Oceans Development and International Law. Um, and for that research, we undertook a detailed analysis of opportunities across um, different laws and policies that impact marine areas and resources in Aotearoa. And that was a really big challenge um, because there was a lot to cover. Um, and so this model shows the scope and approach of that research. And you can see there that we focused on four key areas of law and policy, which are um, fisheries, um, managing environmental effects, um, biodiversity conservation, and Māori tiriti rights. And we applied lessons from our earlier research that Eric um, spoke about earlier, where we identified a need for a strong anchor um, to set a sort of a fundamental vision or approach for our marine law and policy in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and sort of consistent what we call hooks across different, um, which may remain sectoral policy frameworks, um, 
but um, a need for those to be anchored by an overall anchor. Um, so we had a look across these four key areas of law and policy for examples of anchors and hooks and the lessons that we could draw out from them about where Aotearoa needs to go. Um, and we were very conscious in doing so um, of scale dynamics, of different temporal scales, um, spatial scales and jurisdictional and organisational scales. Um, and in order to carry out this work, we undertook the usual um, legal and policy methods of research as well as literature re review, um, but we also tested our findings through workshops with a range of stakeholders and also with hapu in place. So what did we find? We found that there are some key time sensitive opportunities in Aotearoa New Zealand right now across these four areas to better align our law and policy to an EBM approach. And these are summarised in this table, which I hope you're able to read, um, but we have a summary up on the Sustainable Seas website too. Um, so at the top of this table, it sets out the things that we see as anchors and foremost, um, our Foremost, our anchor is Te Tiriti or Waitangi, our founding constitutional document, um, international law and our obligations under international treaties and agreements um, will also be an anchor. Um, and their recognition potentially of environmental rights and responsibilities could form an anchor, um, although we don't really have that yet. Um, I'll note that there is a private members bill before parliament at the moment, which is seeking to do that. Um, but there is a need we identify in this research for Aotearoa to agree on what we call um, the fundamental marine principles. And, and other people have called it different things, maybe an ocean strategy or an ocean's policy or an ocean's vision. Um, and that we need that to guide EBM across sectors and scales. And that is really important because of what we said earlier, that we can't just only have one ocean's law to govern everything. There are just too many areas of law and policy that touch on human interactions with oceans and coasts. Um, but we do need consistency in terms of the fundamentals that we're trying to achieve, and we don't have that consistency right now. We made some suggestions about the enabling conditions that would allow those anchors to do their job, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, but you can see um, in the sort of middle body of this table, we've outlined, identified a range of hooks. Um, these are explored in more detail in the research. Um, but we pointed out a range of existing developing or possible legal policy mechanisms that support EBM um, and need to be integrated and coordinated, if, even if they remain under um, independent legal frameworks. In most cases, um, these are things that already exist to a degree. Um, things like, for example, we have Te Oranga or Te Taiao, power sharing arrangements with Māori, um, place-based fisheries collaborations, but we also point out opportunities for new things and we identify things like flexible corridor um, or bioregional planning um, or a national fisheries policy. Um, and although in many cases, many of these things do already currently exist in our law and policy, they tend to be ad hoc, as Eric said earlier, and not very well integrated. Um, then at the bottom of this table, we've identified enabling processes to support um, integration in these hooks. And um, these include, of course, Tiriti partnership across all sectors and all scales, tikanga and mataranga Māori, which promotes holism and interconnectedness and relationality, um, place-based go collaborative governance and power sharing with iwi and hapu, biocultural and mixed-use MPAs, we're seeing some more examples of those coming out, um, flexible localised risk assessments and ecosystem-based climate adaptation. Um, so that got us then thinking about the sorts of governance and, and institutional arrangements that could support um, better anchoring, better integration of these some of these things that we already have and some things that we need. Um, so we consider that EBM can and should take place across a range of sectors and scales um, as guided by this very strong anchor. 
But in order for that to happen, we need whole of government leadership on oceans. And it's very difficult, our study suggested, for that um, cohesive and holistic whole of government leadership to occur where oceans policy is implemented through what we call sectoral line departments that have their own objectives and functions and reporting lines. Um, so many researchers working in this space have argued for some sort of an oceans agency or institution. And I want to shout out to the Lever Rooms Oceans Mo Roadmap, which just came out last week, which is also saying the same thing. Um, the work from EDS has said the same thing. The work from Karen Scott has said the same thing, um, that we need some sort of an oceans um, agency to support this cross-sectoral collaboration. And we believe, um, based on our research, that we need a ministry for the ocean to be driving this policy development and leadership um, to develop the fundamental marine principles and do so in a TIDITI compliant manner. Um, so a dedicated ministry would allow that coherent policy development and implementation and oversight. Um, there might still be a need for an independent oceans agency, and I note that plenty of researchers have emphasised the need for some sort of oceans commission or agency to operate at arm's length from, gov from government, um, and that could be maybe part of an oceans commission or another function for the EPA or the Parliamentary Commission of the Environment, but we see that as being in addition to uh, um, the need for bold policy leadership within government to um, to roll out this this policy approach. Um, so now I will hand back to Eric. Um, and so our last substantive piece of research is, is currently out for review um, and hopefully publishing of that will be imminent. But that was led by Julia Talbot Jones from Victoria University. Um, and focused on on transitions and how transition how how, how does that occur? Right? Transition to EBM um, in terms of marine and coastal management. <clears throat> Excuse me. A large piece of that work was is drawing on resilience thinking, um, and particularly around the concepts of adaptability and transformability, um, in terms of helping to define where we want to go in law and policy, and also partly how we actually get there. Um, and, and looked at a couple of case studies um, around Aotearoa. One of the interesting findings, in, in my opinion, it's, it's close to home, was was in Kaikoura. We, we had a little bit of a look at, at the um, Te Korawai situation down there with, with, the, um, with the act that was implemented, put in place, and we, we observed from that that it looked very, very good from a process perspective that the, the Kaikoura Marine Guardians was a multi-stakeholder group um, which came together and, and, and planned for the future of their moana um, in terms of the outcomes that they were hoping to achieve and, and, and what tools could be implemented to put them in place and create a, a network of marine protected areas, um, created new uh, regulatory rules around recreational fishing in terms of bag limits and things. Um, but it also, when the act was put in place, put all the decision-making straight back to the minister again. So it looked and, and, and was in fact, a very highly collaborative approach to managing their marine environment. But when the act was put in, all the decision-making went back to the minister. And, and so it actually took away that that direct engagement of the local people and, and to, to be one of providing advice. And I guess many people will know what happened when the power fishery was reopened after the earthquake. Um, the minister chose not to take advice from the Kaikoura Marine Guardian and when the fishery was reopened, it was five to seven times the recreational allocation was, was taken out in the space of three months. So we know we can do good things, but we, we almost trip ourselves up along the way at times when it comes to implementation. So this, this work around resilience and, and 
the concepts of adaptability and transformation that say that we actually need to purposefully transform and shift from one management state to another management state. Um, and, and, and adaption, doing a little bit along the way, probably isn't going to be um, suffice to protect our marine environment and move us towards EBM. Um, we, we need something a bit more um, immediate and deliberate um, and not so modest. Um, and we actually have a range of tools that are available to us um, that can transition us towards EBM and, and which is which is more than just marine spatial planning, which tends to provide a, a rather static outcome. Um, so where to from here? <clears throat> um, I guess you know, we, we've, we've talked about fragmentation a lot. We've talked about complexity. Um, we've talked about scales. So it's a really, I guess the old term was, was wicked and messy um, scenario in terms of marine governance. Um, and as we, if you want to flick over, Liz, please, there's just so much happening all the time. The, these are some of the policy developments that's going on, some of the policy developments that's going on in the marine and coastal area today. And, and so I guess it's our work, so we, so we do think it, but that really to us highlights the importance of developing our anchors and the fundamental marine principles so that all of this policy development actually speaks to achieving those principles um, and, and, and will help where, where currently pieces of legislation don't talk to each other and, and you may need to prioritise between them in terms of getting outcomes and having those fundamental marine principles or anchors can help help you do that, um, make those calls um, and, and deal with the, the complexity, the, 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 the rapid state of change, the information overload that, that, that is coming. Um, without those principles, where, where I'll use the ad hoc word again, um, but if we want to use a marine al analogy, we could say we're actually a little rudderless. Um, and, and the policy just simply can't keep up with the rate of change that we're experiencing. And so the, out of the challenge, um, they've developed seven principles for EBM, which you can see on the screen there. Um, so, so that, that they they form a set of principles that we can look towards. Um, also, out of the challenge, uh, Catherine Short and her team have developed some blue economy principles. Um, but a, as Liz said earlier, we we fundamentally believe that sitting alongside those, we we need principles for Aotearoa's marine space. Um, and the next piece is had a little bit of a think about, um, and this speaks to the table earlier that Liz, Liz put up, um, about how the ministry might work and how it, how the, where the anchors fit um, and, and what processes might be required. So this is just taking one slice of the management piece out and, and talking to how the anchors are given effect by different pieces of legislation and policy, which are actually hooks, um, how the ministry would be, could be responsible for, for deriving those anchors, um, framing those overarching objectives, um, facilitating periodic reviews, and then helping assisting um, implementation of that through the line agencies, um, which would still exist, um, importantly, Still need to exist. Um, I th think there's th there needs to be healthy debate between the different purposes of, of the different act, um, and and putting all of the management of everything into one agency or ministry rather um, might not be the best way to get that healthy um, tension between different purposes. Um, then we hypothesised that 
um, it would be really nice to have a, have a, a knowledge hub to support, um, which is starting to bring in the science and research world. Um, and that, that could be could be virtual um, or full-time or a mixture of both. Uh, yeah, so it's just how do we start to deal with the fragmentation that's there um, and, and start to build the relationships? And this is just start up a 10 on how we might go about that. Um, and Liz and Karen and I recently wrote a piece on the conversation, which Liz is going to talk to. Yeah, so we wrote this piece um, also as a companion to our research that we've been talking about today, but really to try and raise more awareness around um, the need for more attention to marine policy. We've had a lot of attention to, to terrestrial environmental policy, um, but we think that more attention needs to be given to oceans and coasts and our policy development. Um, and this article touches on issues like the Kermadec issue, um, where we've seen really hard fought Tiriti rights and interests being pitted off against conservation in really, frankly, unhelpful conversations that position marine protection versus marine utilisation. Um, and in developing fundamental marine principles, if that's what we call it, that's one of the first things that we need to resolve. And it's not just about fisheries. There are other decisions we need to make about uh, marine relationships and marine economies and reconciling multiple ocean relationships as new industries develop. And we're seeing a lot of um, energy and interest around new industries like offshore aquaculture and offshore wind, um, development of blue carbon. So, um, you know, these conversa conversations need to be had. And... I take hope from the prospect of an iwi-led Indigenous approach to um, how we go about marine protection and marine relationships and marine economies in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, this is, as Tohu Kaimoana put it, a relationship with people, people and nature together, not separate. Um, so that is a conversation that, that still needs to, um, you know, run its course in Aotearoa. Um, so on that note, I want to thank everybody who has assisted us with this research, who's engaged with us in workshops or given us feedback on the development of our work. Um, of course, I want to thank all of the researchers in our particular team of law and policy for EBM, but there are researchers um, and partners across the Sustainable Seas Challenge who um, have really helped us in developing our thinking. Um, our research is all on the website. There are um, end user targeted summaries of the journal articles there as well. Um, and yeah, really look forward to um, a bit of Q&A now and some feedback and discussion. So kia ora koutou, um, tēnā tato katoa. Kia ora nahimihi to our presenters uh, for your wonderful discussion. Uh, so we've had a few questions come through in the Q&A. Uh, if you do have a question, please pop them through and we'll get started on those questions. Uh, so we had one come through earlier on in the presentation. Uh, what are your key arguments against one new EBM Kaitiakitanga based act that repeals the mess? Yes, relationships are crucial, but aren't we at risk of going around in circles otherwise? I can probably take that first one. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm, we're not saying that there is no use in having any sort of oceans-based legislation. Um, and it may be that if what we call fundamental marine principles can be developed, that it would be useful for them to take some sort of legislative form. But what we are saying is that um, the idea of just creating one Oceans Act that does everything um, for the ocean is, is actually, it's just not going to be possible. There are just so many areas of policy across, you know, shipping, transport and land use, in fact, that impact significantly on the health of marine ecosystems. So um, 
the the easy answer of oh we just create an oceans act um, is not necessarily going to do it and i think we've learned from the rma reform process that it is actually very difficult um so yeah i suppose that um that's really the short answer i don't know if i suppose i could potentially um open that up to eric and karen for if they want to add anything to that I think that's a fair summary, Liz. More than fair. Yep. Yeah, I I agree. <laughs> I don't have anything else to add. Great, thank you. Uh, I've got another question from Graham. Is the RMA replacement helping or hindering integration across the ocean scope? I feel like I could probably answer that one too. Um, I was involved with the challenge leading the submission on the Natural and Built Environment Bill. Um, and, you know, I we, we did quite a lot of work as part of that process of trying to get the ocean in there because in the original drafts, there really wasn't much interrelationship um, or sort of it didn't really reflect a Kyoto Kitai situation of of oceans being receiving environments for um, land use decisions. Um, but I think that the final version of the legislation um, provides me with a little bit more hope that it will provide opportunities for more integration, um, but it is still largely a, a, a land focused piece of le legislation. And until now, regional councils have been focused on terrestrial planning rather than um, marine and coastal planning. Um, I do believe that the regional spatial planning approach may provide new opportunities and we've identified that in our research. Um, so tentatively hopeful, but also cautious and aware that um, with a change of government, things could be up in the air again too. Great, thank you. Uh, a question from Grace. What are your thoughts on the potential introduction of a biodiversity credit scheme in New Zealand? Do you think this will add to the complexity of policy levers? Will the cons outweigh the pros in your opinion? Okay, I'll probably take this one too, just because it's very short <laughs> to say that um, it's on our list. I haven't had a good look at it yet, but we are going to be looking at that um, and across a few different projects. Um, I think that uh, a number of reports recently have highlighted the potential value opportunities and complications of things like biodiversity credits and also blue carbon um, in the marine space. And I think there is a real need for more research about this um, and understanding the legal and policy and practice settings that will enable these things to do what they need to and not create any sort of perverse outcomes. So I think just a, just a signal that much more to come on that. Great. A uh, question from Catherine. Has anyone analysed the cost of operating the current 25 plus pieces of legislation versus a simpler reduced number of laws and agencies? Eric, you can do that one. <laughs> um, to the best of my knowledge, Catherine, no. Um, is, is a concise answer. Um, yeah. yeah, I would just add that definitely court is not the place to make policy. It's not an effective or efficient way to be developing. Yeah, yeah and I was just going to add that no as well. I don't think that analysis has been done. And uh, similarly, courts aren't, aren't the place for mm. that kind of policy development because it's too ad hoc. Got it. Thank you. Uh, a question from Alex. Have you spoken with political parties about your great mahi? And if so, have you had any feedback? We have had some engagement with um, political parties who have seen our work and being interested in it. Um, and I think we're just waiting to see what happens, like most of you 
um, with the election, I, I think that the challenge is really open to um, putting the great research that's been done within sustainable seas before um, current and potential policy makers. Yeah. So I feel we've had good feedback and we've also engaged well, um, you know, with other organisations because we're not the only ones who are pushing for this. And I think that the more voices that are that are putting out this message around a need for lead leadership and governance and attention and resourcing for the ocean, the better. Great, thank you. A uh, question from Megan. Your table of anchors and hooks and enablers was really useful in thinking about what could work. Was there anything fundamental uh, any fundamental impediments identified, any process or piece of legislation that either currently impedes or, if removed, would make a big difference? <laughs> okay, I'll put my hand up. Um, I, I think the the transitioning through scales is is the biggest impediment um and yeah particularly the um spatial scales i, I mean i guess we, we're still stuck in this paradigm where we don't actually plan that far ahead um in terms of intergenerational um temporal scales but the the transition of scale from national to regional and to local um and, and how we how we plan for that and implement that is is probably the I, I would say is one of the one of the biggest challenges. Um, yeah. Anything further, team? I just think resourcing, to be honest, was <laughs> a really big thing. Resourcing policy yeah. commitment, yeah, but it it goes to what Eric was. Thinking. All right, thank you. Uh, another question. I agree that there is a need to meaningfully transform management from one type to another, and immediate and deliberate change is necessary. What might that look like in practice at a local scale as opposed to a national scale? What can I do as a graduate student to help bridge the gap between theory and implementation of holistic co-governance? I'll jump in quickly and say, um, building on what Liz said, there's a resourcing and capacity issue that I think those are the biggest challenges to enable that meaningful transformation. Um, because these sorts of things take time and energy. And so that needs to be supported. It's great that you're thinking about this um, as a graduate student. Um, you are our future, so that's fantastic. But I think... Um, yeah, I see that as a, as a real challenge and I don't know, you know, maybe there needs to be, I don't quite know how to overcome that other than, yeah, the sort of stronger national direction and a stronger commitment maybe at that national level and that sort of freeing up the capacity or providing resourcing so that there is capacity to act and then it's lower scales and then maybe that can be translated into um, other actions at different, at that sort of higher level scales, but. I'll hand it over to the others. Yeah, I, I, I'd just add to that. I think, Karen, that um, getting our fundamental oceans principles in place is, is a really is a good start um, because what that can do is not directly empower or enable, but it actually provides uh, a, a bit of a platform for local action. Um, yeah. Yeah, and gives a sense of what, what people should be working towards as well. Yeah. Cool. 
Lovely, thank you. Our uh, next question is a bit of a long one, so just bear with me. Uh, I wonder if an alternative or key focus could be on equipping stakeholders or partners around ecosystems to provide the integration rather than hoping or expecting there to be top-down alignment. Government agencies struggle to align their respective responsibilities, whereas local actors working collaboratively can achieve lots, as you've noted. What we traditionally fail to do is invest in what's needed for successful collaborative effort. Has your research explored collective impact models suitably for the marine environment? Karen, I feel like you can take this one. Well, I was just going to say, <laughs> I was just moving, moving things on my screen. A screen. Um, we haven't we haven't explicitly explored collective impact models, um, as as you've put it. But we, I guess, what we have sought to do is identify models where there are those sorts of um, where we can see things are working and are happening. And we tended to um, want to emphasise, I think, the sort of things that happen at particular places. But one of the so, I think it's fair to say that the the team sort of agrees with that idea of. Um, thinking about how can stakeholders or partners in iwi, Māori iwi at those more local levels, how can they be equipped or supported to, um, to enable them to continue to, doing, to do what they're doing? So it's about enhancing what's already being undertaken. But I guess then the challenge is how does that scale? And I think there are risks in just thinking about how to scale things up. So it's more about how can you make, how can you provide those sorts of opportunities for place-based initiatives to flourish? And because um, I don't think it's simply just saying, oh, this worked in this place, let's do it in that place. Because, you know, different places have different kinds of histories and politics and economies and things like that. So we can't adopt a one size fits all approach. It's thinking about how to amplify what's happening in these local communities and providing that resourcing. But I can see Eric's chomping at the bit to say something. <laughs> so I'll hand over to you. Oh, my cogs were slowly turning. Um, the other thing as well, however, is that currently to actually do something still requires support from agencies because they actually have the levers um, in there um, and the tools to do stuff. So th there is a and remains to be a disconnect on, on that side. So, um, and, and I mean, that was seen in, in Kaikoura, for instance. Um, and the, the model that developed Kaikoura used, used an egg analogy um, whereby the agencies were supporting and enabling the process, um, but the decisions were actually made by Te Korowai. Um, so that, that's something to think about as well. But how you, if, can you, how, if, if you could, how would you supercharge that to have it happening in, in, in however many locations around New Zealand? Um, so as Liz touched on before, you know, there, there would be a, a, a significant resourcing implication, uh, significant resourcing implications of doing something like that. And we still need to <clears throat> ensure that the sum of the part meets the whole in terms of, say, New Zealand's international obligations. Um around various various outcomes, whether it's marine protection, fisheries management, um, yeah, carbon emissions, yeah. And I'd just like to add, like I absolutely agree that we do fail to invest properly on, on ensuring successful collaborative efforts. So, so that is something that needs to be addressed. And it takes time. These collaborative efforts take a lot of time, so yeah. Uh, we are getting close to our end time, but I think we can squeeze one more question in. Uh, I've got a question from Ani. Kia ora, Ani. Uh, customary tools such as Rahui are actually limited in the ways of managing fisheries, as the legal version is defined by the Crown, who also hold the power to authorise Rahui. Do you see an opportunity to ground customary fisheries management tools according to Tangata Whenua to properly care for the relationship and flexibility needed to better adapt changes in the local fisheries by Mana Moana? 
I can probably say something about that. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, thanks, Ani. I mean, when in our research we looked at um, customary or tikanga based ahui as as well as fisheries closures under the legislation, um, and when we're talking about rahui being adaptive and flexible, um, we're talking about the tikanga based customary rahui. You know, that a rahui like that can respond to um, in a, a shock that's happening immediately, and it can be in place within. Out, you know, minutes slash hours, whereas we have processes, um, legal processes that take a very long time to go through um, administrative decision making and appeals and um, that sort of, you know, developing regional spatial strategies under the new RMA replacement legislation that's going to take decades, right? So, um, yes, absolutely. I think that we need more jurisdiction for rangatiratanga, for iwi and hapu. Um, I say that consistently through my research. Um, and more and more people are emphasising that um, flexibility and adaptiveness of of tikanga and the role that tikanga and mātauranga have to play in this, you know, tiriti consistent um, policy approach. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge lots of other wonderful questions and comments and feedback, um, which are really great to see in the chat. And I wish that actually we had more time to talk about all of those. There is a great comment there about uh, MACA legislation too and the injustices caused by that process. So I think that... Um, if anyone has any other feedback for us um, or questions or wants to have a chat, please do contact us because um, we would love to hear from you. Kia ora. And Eric and Karen might have something to add on that last point. I guess just for the Rahui question, my answer would be yes. <laughs> then everything else you said, Liz. <laughs> Well, kia ora. thank you. And to just jump on what Liz was saying there, we haven't managed to get through all of the questions. There's been some really great ones in there, uh, but we might see what we can do about answering some of them via email. Uh, we will send out the recording to this uh, presentation in the next 24 hours or so, and I will also link in uh, most of the resources that were referenced in the presentation today, so you can check those out for yourselves. Uh, that should be in your inbox within the next 24 hours or so. But otherwise, Nahimi Nui, a uh, big thank you to everyone for joining us today uh, and for all of the wonderful questions and for hearing your, our research. Uh, and keep an eye on our website so you can sign up to our newsletter there for more updates from the challenge. Kakiti anō.